This uh, webinar is presented by the Minnesota Prevention Resource Center, which is funded by the Department of Human Services Behavioral Health D Division. Just some general etiquette for our call today. Um, you've entered the webinar on mute. Please remain on mute um, unless the host unmutes you when you have, if you have a question. However, we encourage you to use the chat box or to raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. Um, and then just a reminder to please fill out the evaluation at the end of this webinar. It helps us craft uh, trainings that uh, work for your work and, and cover topics that you want to hear. So a little bit about the Minnesota Prevention Resource Center. Um, this is, we are the home of substance abuse prevention resources across the state of Minnesota. From our online webinars, newsletters, and resource library to in-person trainings and ongoing technical assistance, we can help strengthen your prevention efforts. Now, MPRC is just one of three pillar, pillars of ATOD prevention uh, in, in the state. Uh, we uh, have two partners in, in this work. One is Substance Abuse, or Substance Use Minnesota, SUMN.org. Uh, this is a great site that provides impactful data to help you make informed decisions, monitor trends, share data effectively with stakeholders, and establish priorities with your community. We encourage you to visit this website and look at all the great tools and resources that are there for your work. The other pillar is the Regional Prevention Coordinators, uh, otherwise known as the RPCs. There are uh, RPCs across the state in seven different regions. Your RPC is the local point person on your prevention efforts. They provide personal support and consultation to build your network. They help you plan, put your plan into action, and evaluate if that plan is actually working for your community or if you need to make adjustments. When in doubt in any of your prevention work, contact your RPC and they will help guide you. So like I said, there are three pillars and actually four pillars. The fourth pillar is you. Anybody that works in prevention is a prevention champion. So MPRC provides the resources, SUMN provides the data, your RPC provides one-on-one -on -one support, and then you as a prevention champion, all those pieces together create a successful prevention picture in Minnesota. A little bit about our presenter before I hand it over to Anne. Uh, Anne Phibbs, PhD, is the founder and president of Strategic Diversity Initiatives, and she brings over 25 years of experience to helping orgs advance their equity, diversity, and inclusion goals. She has a really impressive uh, background that I think you'll see reflected in the materials that she's sharing with everybody today. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Anne now. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon, and thanks to everyone who's, who's here. I'm um, if you could be a little patient with me as I pull up my PowerPoint. I'm not the most technologically savvy person in the world. So, um, and thank you to Emily and to Isha for all their help uh, getting, getting going with this. I'm excited to be here with you today. Um, as Emily mentioned, I am the president of Strategic Diversity Initiatives and just by way of a little bit of introduction, moved to Minnesota 30 years ago to get a PhD in philosophy and kind of fell in love with the state, decided to stay. Uh, I uh, worked, uh, have done a lot of work in higher ed. I was 11 years at Metro State University. I was the first ever GLBT student services director. Really proud of that fact. Uh, and then I uh, moved over to back to the U of M and worked there for 11 years. Did LGBTQIA work there and then uh, became the first ever director of education at the U of M uh, where I developed a certificate program, a series of 10 workshops, three hours each. So really robust 30 hour curriculum that's still going strong. And then I left about three years ago to start my own company and then whatever space will have me, corporate, nonprofit, government, higher ed, uh, arts organizations, faith communities, wherever uh, people wanna talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, I'm willing to come in. And so uh, I'm excited to share this workshop webinar I'm calling Showing Up for Your Clients and Colleagues, Being an Ally and Addressing Microaggressions. Um, forgive me, I'm gonna go ahead and Whoopsie. Uh, so what are we going to do? I'm going to start by doing some framing uh, because I want to kind of create a frame around diversity, equity, and inclusion that we can then, you can put your context uh, of what you do uh, into that frame. And so I'm going to talk about diversity. I'm also going to talk about equity. Those are two different things, not the same thing. Uh, and in between, I'm going to talk about how the landscape is changing, uh, both socially kind of just writ large, but also in the workplace. And then I have a couple slides that, that remind us about uh, how we can use an equity lens while living through this pandemic. And then we'll talk specifically about one way that these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion play out uh, or show up rather in our workplace, and that's uh, microaggressions or micro inequities. We'll talk about that. We'll take a little poll uh, about your experiences with microaggressions. Then we'll talk about and see a video, a short video about what it means to act as an ally. 
um, we'll have some scenarios and an opportunity for Q&A. So I do encourage you to, to think about if there are questions or comments that you want to make. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in and I'll just say it right off the bat. Uh, I know I'm breaking the first rule of PowerPoints when, uh, which is way too many words. And I, I'm well aware of that. Um, at the same time, I like words. Um, what can I say? I'm an academic. Um, and this PowerPoint will be emailed to everyone uh, who's a participant today. So you will have access to it. So I'm just gonna start by, um, by sharing uh, an article that kind of says it all in the title. How diversity makes us smarter being around people who are different from us makes us more creative more diligent and harder working uh, by Catherine Phillips in Scientific American and what she says is that not all of us realize we kind of know if we get people with different perspectives you know the poet the mechanic the the um, social worker the attorney working on a problem they're going to approach the problem differently and you'll probably get a better outcome people don't realize that's also true around uh, social identities. These are our identities based on social factors like race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, nationality, religion, age, class. Uh, and, and what she does in this article is fill it with lots of examples of ways that um, having a diverse team, whether it's a team at the top of an organization, or uh, at one point she talks about a political science professor who studies juries and, and has shown that all white juries don't function as well as multi-race juries. So, um, so she just fills this with studies if you're interested. But what she says is that, that uh, we come away realizing we want diverse teams. And it's not only because people with different backgrounds bring new information, simply interacting with people who are different forces group members to prepare better, anticipate alternative viewpoints, and expect that reaching consensus will take effort. So if I think everybody on my team thinks just like me, I don't have to bring my A game. I don't have to step it up. But if I think I might get some pushback, I might get someone who really doesn't agree with me, I'm gonna be better prepared. So this really is the tip of the iceberg of, of what's out there. But let me be very clear, we can have a very diverse team, a diverse workforce, a diverse school, whatever. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's equitable, right? They're two different things. And so I, when I say, you know, we, we can have a lot of diversity without equity, unfortunately I've described too much, too many places in the United States where I think that's true. So we're gonna, we're gonna loop back around to equity, but first I wanna share three ways that I think our kind of social landscape and our workplace landscape is changing. And the first is around disability. So this is an article from CNN Business, more people with disabilities are getting jobs. And I'm sure you know that uh, people with disabilities are much more likely to be unemployed and underemployed compared to people without disabilities. And in fact, only 40% of adults with disabilities in their prime working uh, years, you know, 25 to 54 have a job compared to almost double that of people without disabilities. And this is a big deal, not only because of economic security, but because of a sense of purpose and also community. We get a lot of community from our workplaces. So there's been a really big push to get people with disabilities into the workplace. I know the state of Minnesota has been working hard on that. And if you're like me, when you hear the word disability, you tend to go to a stereotype, uh, an image maybe of someone who uses a wheelchair, someone who's blind or low vision, deaf, or hard of hearing. Um, but in fact, most of the people you ever meet who have a disability, you'll never know it because most people, uh, most disabilities are non apparent. Um, and according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI, um, one in five, 20% of Americans live with a mental health condition, which is millions and millions of people. Uh, I've had the good fortune of hearing Sue Abder Holden uh, talk a number of times. She's the executive director of Minnesota NAMI. And she says, look, you know, uh, your friend breaks their leg, they're fighting cancer, they're in the hospital, what do you do? You, you send a card, you send flowers, you go visit. But now you have a different friend. They're struggling with anxiety and depression, so they're on the psychiatric unit of the same hospital. You send a card, you send flowers, you go visit. She says, I know you don't, because I talk to those people. We don't go visit people who are dealing with psychiatric uh, issues. And yet, she says, both of these people need support, and both of what they're dealing with is medical conditions. But of course, disability, uh, excuse me, mental health issues and mental illness have much more of a stigma. Um, and so the good news is more and more people are coming out about living with mental health conditions. Uh, I myself, uh, I identify as lesbian or queer. I use that word, not everyone does. I've been out since I was 17, 40 years. Kind of rolls off my tongue. Uh, harder for me to tell people I have OCD. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. And there's something about even saying the words that kind of tugs on me. 
uh, when I train, sometimes I say, well, I, you know, take a small amount of medication. I was training. I said that this woman came up to me and she said, did you notice she had to tell us it was a small amount of medication as if it was a large amount, that would be a problem. And I said, well, yeah, I think that's about shame, right? That's about that stigma that still, still tugs on me. Um, so people are pushing on that and saying, hey, this is about being human. We nothing to be ashamed of. Um, we should we should push on that stigma. So we're seeing more and more people come out about it, uh, and there are campaigns like hashtag Cure Stigma. And so we've always had people with disabilities in our workplace, but I think we're going to see more and more discussion about disability and disability justice. And so that is one way that we are changing uh, as a society. I think we're also changing around gender. Um, now I'll show my bias. If someone had said to me, Anne, there are five states that allow you to change your uh, gender identity on your birth certificate. What do you think state number six is going to be? Honestly, I wouldn't have guessed Kansas, uh, but good for Kansas. That's my bias. Um, and so it's California, Colorado, Kansas, New Jersey, Oregon, and Washington now allow you to make that change. And New York City has passed similar legislation. And uh, probably a lot of you know, uh, either you know someone, you yourself are this way, uh, are trans identified, or you, you, you know something about it. But um, I'm going to use my uh, friend Anne, who's an amazing trans activist, as an example. We have folks who, uh, when Anne was born, Anne was identified male at birth. Now, why do I say identified male at birth? Because we don't know what Anne felt, what any baby feels when they're born. We can't communicate with them, obviously. So we identify them based on their bodies. So Anne was identified male at birth, but never felt like uh, a boy or a man, always felt like uh, a girl and a woman, and has transitioned. Um, trans across from male to female is a woman, is a trans woman. Uh, and, and we realized, well, we couldn't keep saying trans and, and non-trans. So we went, we, you know, we were like, what word can we use to describe people who might be born male and then feel like they are uh, a boy and a man? So their kind of gender identity lines up under their uh, assigned sex at birth, right? Kind of on the same side. So we pulled a word from chemistry, cis means on the same side. So now we have folks who are transgender and cisgender, and, and most people are cisgender. But now we have more and more people kind of coming out and saying, well, actually, I don't feel like I'm cisgender or transgender. I don't like that whole binary system. I'm non-binary. And maybe this person might use they, them pronouns. And so that is, I think, a significant change happening in our society. 14 states, including our own Minnesota, allow a third gender option for your driver's license. Nevada is the 10th state or region to offer a gender neutral designation on state IDs. Maryland was the first for voter registration. And millennials now make up over a third of the US workforce, according to Pew. And the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation estimates as many as 12% of millennials may identify as trans or non-binary. So, and forgive me for just kind of checking my watch. I uh, want to check my time. So um, I think this is kind of a genie that's not going back in the bottle. I think we are going to see more and more people uh, coming out and being open about challenging this binary system. And so that is binary gender system. So that is a, a change that is definitely happening. And the third kind of changing landscape slide I have is around race. So I'm sure many of you know that we are changing uh, our racial demographic here in this country and that by the year 2045, so in about 25 years, we will become what is referred to as minority white I like to refer to it as majority people of color and native people. Um, and that can kind of feel like a ways off, 25 years. But actually, um, for children, it's, it's this year. 2020 was the year we became a nation where the majority of our kids are kids of color and native kids. And for those ages 18 to 29, the tipping point will occur in less than 10 years. And I'd like to say, well, you know, unless you are one of the original peoples on this land that became Minnesota, if you're Dakota, Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, uh, some of the other nations, then then you came from somewhere. It just so happened that a lot of folks came from Germany, from Scandinavia, from Ireland, um, and that that's changing. And we're getting people from all other parts of the, of the world. Um, and I'd like to say it doesn't have to be good or bad, although I think it's a good thing, but it can just be, you know, a demographic shift. But I think that would be naive to think that we're going to see this shift and everyone's going to be happy about it. It's not gonna cause any anxiety or any pushback. So I wanna give an example of the kind of pushback that I see happening around these racial changes. And also with it, an increased discussion of racial equity, which we really need to have. So I was, uh, it was a state agency uh, that asked me to come in and talk to their diversity committee. So I went in, didn't know anybody there, had a great conversation. 
And this is a state agency where people um, have shift work, either day or evening. And of course, most people want day shifts. So uh, as I'm leaving the meeting, an older white man I've never met comes up to me and says, um, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I want to tell you why I'm on the diversity committee. Okay, I say, sure. He says, I'm on the committee because I'm convinced they're trying to give all the day shifts to people of color. And uh, I looked at him and I said, well, you know, I, I can't speak to that specific thing, but I can tell you I've worked in diversity work for over 25 years and I've never once met a person of color that I felt was trying to put white people on the bottom. I always felt I've only ever met people of color and native folks who want things to be equitable. But what it told me is he's nervous, right? He's concerned that we're kind of do some kind of flip uh, where we're going to see a change. And so um, I want to share two kind of surveys that, that, that look at what I'm, I'm referring to as kind of pushback about our racial uh, demographic changes in this society. So uh, this is from what Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, National Public Radio, Harvard School of Public Health, surveyed over 3,400 American adults, 902 of them were white. Over half, 55% of the white respondents said they believe discrimination against white people exists in the US today. Now, do I think it's possible that there could be discrimination uh, towards someone because they're white? Of course. Do I think there's a lot of evidence of it? I don't. Um, you know, I, I hope you know that we have some of the worst racial disparities in the entire country right here in, in good old progressive, socially aware Minnesota. Uh, and for every kind of key indicator of, um, of, you know, standard of living, I mean, whether it's housing, healthcare, employment, education, and every one of those categories, white Minnesotans fare better than Minnesotans of color and native Minnesotans. Um, so we don't have evidence that there's a lot of discrimination toward white people. Only 19% of the respondents said it had happened to them. So there's a, there's a difference there. And I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if it might be a perception that as we talk more about racial demographic changes uh, and talk more about racial equity, uh, you might see white people worried that they're going to suddenly be put on the bottom. And if you're tempted, as people are, to say, well, that's just older people. We love to kind of blame stuff on older people. Uh, and think everyone young is woke. Uh, this is from MTV Public Religion Research Institute report. Found uh, 15 to 24 year olds in the poll found that 43% of young white men say discrimination against whites is as serious a problem as discrimination against other groups. I think you can tell by now, I don't believe that that's true. We don't have to agree. It's fine if we disagree. 29% uh, of young white women said that and almost half of the young white men, 48%, believe efforts to increase diversity, now that's what I do every single day, uh, will actually harm white people. And you can probably tell by now, I don't believe that's true. But why do I bring it up to you? Why is it important in this framing? Because this idea that we are going to become an increasingly racially diverse country and state, and we are, um, and workplaces, um, and social spaces, and everyone's going to be okay with it. There's not going to be any pushback. Uh, and we can do what we always do in Minnesota when we have any problems and just not say anything, <laughs> that's not gonna work. We're gonna have to talk about it uh, because, because we're gonna have to talk about the pushback and how to ensure that we keep moving racial equity forward. So I told you I was gonna loop back around to equity and um, this is my slide that talks about why it's not enough to just be diverse, why we also need to pay attention to equity. So the Southern Poverty Law Center says hate groups in the US are at an all time high with over 1,020 in 2018. And according to the FBI, hate crimes increased by 30% in the three years ending in 2017. Um, we see an increase in hate around religion, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, the LGBTQ community, uh, people of color and native people. Uh, they recently did a survey of American Jews in the United States, I guess that's redundant, American Jews, and found that a third of them said that they now choose not to wear anything that identifies them as Jewish. Um, which is very sad when you think about how important it might be for someone to, to wear something that, that is important to them in terms of their religious and cultural identity. An Equal Employment Opportunity Commission survey of over 5,200 newly employed workers found black job seekers were offered significantly less compensation than whites by potential new employee, employers, which is a perfect example of the difference between diversity and equity. We can have very diverse spaces if we don't pay people the same, if we don't have adequate or equal compensation, that's not equity. And even the tech industry, which we think is kind of filled with, you know, young woke millennials, they did a survey around gender and found that 40% of the women they surveyed were paid less than their male counterparts, anywhere from four to 50% less. 
And even if you're paid fairly, um, you might still have a negative experience based on a social identity. So a January 2018 survey found almost four in 10 women, 38% had experienced sexual harassment in their workplace. And I'm throwing stats at you and you know, I realize it kind of washes over us, but I want to tell a story. I was training in a primarily male dominated industry and uh, I had shared that statistic and a young woman raised her hand in the back of the room and she said, well, I can tell you my experience with this, it just happened yesterday. And she works in HR and she was tabling and she um, uh, you know, was trying to get people to work for her company and a young man came up, there were a number of men kind of milling around and this man came up and, and said, you know, they started talking and she happened to share, she used to be a flight attendant. Oh, he said, is it true? The, the rumors about sexual, uh, about flight attendants providing sexual favors to pilots. And before she could stop him, he had proceeded to share his explicit sexual fantasies about flight attendants. And, you know, as she's telling the story, she starts to get teary and apologizes to her colleagues. Um, and what's sad is not only that she endured that, because you shouldn't have to hear that when you go to work, but also that none of the men around him uh, said anything at all. There were no allies for her in that in that space. Finally, in May 2019, the Department of Health and Human Services proposed a rule that would remove all recognition that federal law prohibits transgender patients from discrimination in healthcare. What does that mean? Well, my friend Anne, uh, what it means for someone like her, I've had the good fortune of training the um, medical students at the University of Minnesota for the last three years. And in August this year, I told them that when they become a physician, they can decide they don't want to train. Uh, treat someone just because they're transgender and it will be perfectly legal because of the federal government. Now this law is in the courts, so we're hoping it'll be overturned, but I don't wanna live in a society where people are fearful to wear something that identifies their religious or cultural identity, where people can't get the healthcare they need because someone might be biased. And so these, these issues are important. And why do I share them for you? Because we wanna, we want to believe maybe that's outside of our workplace. But the fact is there is no, there's no concrete barrier. We bring these issues into our workplace. And just to pull in the COVID piece, which I'm calling centering equity in our new normal, that this inequity and bias and oppression that existed before COVID-19 is only heightened in a situation where there's increased fear, anxiety, uncertainty. Consider the increased harassment we've seen for Asians and Asian Americans, people even referring to it as the China virus, this increased domestic violence or what some are calling intimate terrorism for those forced to live with abusers, low wage wor workers having no choice but to continue working in situations that increase their exposure with lack of access to insurance and medical care an issue for millions. Uh, we also know that uh, we're seeing increased rates of uh, infection and death in communities of color, new immigrant communities, um, for many working from home and also those essential workers, the tasks of managing children, caring for the elderly parents, taking care of oneself and others who may be ill, and being responsible for the emotional labor of navigating a pandemic is not easy for really any of us. Um, this may fall disproportionately on women. Why? Because in general, that kind of emotional labor, the labor of, of maintaining a home, we know still disproportionately falls to women. And finally, people have expectations to maintain productivity in the midst of this pandemic, while at the same time, employees might be worried that they might lose their job and so don't want to push back on something that might be unfair. So all of this is a frame to say this affects all of us every day and we need to be thinking about it and thinking about how we can act as allies. So I want to move on to talking about one of the particular ways that this impacts us in our, in our workplaces, microaggressions or micro inequities. And why do I use two words for the same concept? Well, uh, cheesy joke warning, I like to say in Minnesota, we like our uh, aggression with a good dose of passivity, right? So aggression can be a hard word for people, but let's just use microaggressions, uh, sorry, micro inequities. It's micro, it's not the worst thing, you know, biggest thing, case of racism or sexism or homophobia. And, but it's inequitable. It's, it's some, when you say or do something, or don't say or don't do something, that sends a message, I see you differently. I see you through a lens of a stereotype. I like this website, microaggressions.com, because it, uh, it is a place where people can write in their own lived experience and how it made them feel. So they say each event observation experience posted is not necessarily particularly striking in and of themselves. So I've got about four slides I'm gonna share with you. These are not the worst cases 
of bias that you've ever heard. Often they're never meant to hurt, it's acts done with little conscious awareness of their meanings and effects. This is the notion of intent versus impact. If we just go to the intent, why did you do this? Oh, I didn't mean anything, I was just making a joke. Oh, not a big deal, no malicious intent. No, we always have to go to the impact. How did it feel when this happened to you? Um, and instead their slow accumulation during a childhood and over a lifetime is in part what defines a marginalized experience. So it's not just that it's a one-time thing. These, these, these comments, these stereotypes, these, these biases are uh, cumulative and affect people. I, I will tell this story. I had a guy come up to me and he said, you know, Ann, I used to think that microaggressions were just about millennials whining. And I thought, wow, you managed to, thought, uh, you managed to weave a microaggression right into your comment. Uh, but he said, I don't think that anymore. Um, and I think that's good because it's not about whining. It's not about your skin is too thin. You know, you just need to be able to take a joke. These things really do impact people's experiences in life and in the workplace. So I'm gonna share some from this website uh, and I'll read them to you. A security guard approaches me at an upscale shopping district. I'm the only black person sitting in the waiting area. I'm waiting for a friend and have been sitting for two minutes. The security guard ignores the throng of people around me, comes to me and asks, what is your business here? I'm 31 and in Chicago and it made me feel like I was nothing. Are you a man or a woman? Repeatedly, everywhere. My boss isn't around the business much. When he does come in, he firmly shakes hands with and looks into the eyes of every male employee. I, a female, am the manager of these male employees, and he asks me to make him a cup of coffee and tells me to smile more. I sometimes, when I'm training, ask those who identify as, as men in my workshop to think about, uh, to ask the women around them, their coworkers, their colleagues, the people that they love, their friends and family, uh, who are female identified, how often they've been told to smile. Uh, by someone they don't know, and then compare that to how often you as a man has been, have been told to smile, and I would guarantee it's usually different. Coworker, so you were born and raised here? Me, yeah, coworker, and you're still Muslim? At my first day of training at a new job, where he was trying to explain that Islam has too many rules for an American to follow, it makes me feel sad to have to deal with more determined ignorance of Islam. Man nearly runs over my mom in a store and starts snapping at her for putting her arms out to protect herself. Man, the problem with you immigrants is that you think you can do whatever you want. Mom, how do you know I'm an immigrant? Man, take a look in a mirror. What if you accidentally slept with a schizophrenic guy and had another baby? Said by a girl at work, I have a relative with schizophrenia and have struggled with depression in the past. Made me feel sad, angry, and like people are always going to judge you and define you by your mental illness. I'm in a pharmacy and need something for a sports injury. When I tell the assistant, she laughs, and so does her colleague. I'm 59 years of age and female. White coworker, you're really good at this job, but I gotta admit it still bothers me when people like you come to this country and take jobs from real Americans. Where do you think I'm from? Well, I don't know what you are, but I know you're something. What are you? Native American. Oh, then I guess you didn't come here, huh? At work, made me feel stunned, angry, hurt. Pretty much any time I leave the house in my wheelchair and go to a public place, people feel entitled to come up and ask me the most intrusive personal questions. On a weekly basis, someone asks me, what's wrong with you? People frequently talk over my head to my friends or family members like I am mentally impaired. Many people have told me that they can relate to my disability because they were on crutches for several weeks with a sprained ankle or broken leg. I'm 27 years old and the comments are always the worst in big cities and on public transportation. Makes me feel anxious, frustrated, angry, and sad. And my last slide. My white supervisor at work comes up to me first thing in the morning and says, I've been wanting to do this and puts her hands in my curly African-American hair. It's still wet because it's early in the morning. She recoils and looks at me like I'm the gross one. You're married? Coworker to me. I get this a lot since I am obese. I love people who are gay. I have lots of gay friends. I just don't think you are. My friend in response to my coming out is bisexual last year. And finally, I mentioned to a coworker that I grew up in a trailer park and she says, but you're so smart. So these are examples of things that people experience in the workplace. My, my guess is that you may have experienced uh, similar things or know people who have. So we have a poll and I have two questions. I'm gonna, um, I think, put them both up. And my questions for you are, um, I have experienced a witness to microaggression and you can explain what happened if you're comfortable in the chat window. Um, so why don't you go ahead. Thank you, Isha, for popping that up. I have experienced or witnessed a microaggression. Frequently, occasionally, rarely, or never. So we'll give you a minute to do that.
I apologize. I'm trying to pull up the chat and I'm having difficulty to see if anybody has any comments. So, whoops. Um, so I think we're probably going to see what the response was for this. And I do apologize about the chat. Um, so 17% of you have frequently experienced a microaggression, 59% occasionally. So take that in. That is 76%. Um, over three quarters of you. Somebody's uh, maybe showing me the... Uh, so take that in, that over 76% of the people on this call have either, have at some point occasionally uh, uh, experienced one. 22% um, rarely and only 2% never. And now I'm finding my chat if I can find a way to, uh, I'm having a difficult time with the chat. I apologize for that. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the second, have Nisha pull up the second one uh, question, which is, I have committed a microaggression. Um, and and the reason I say this is because, quite honestly, all of us will. This is not about having everyone run to HR. Um, we, we are going to commit microaggressions. And what we want is to create an atmosphere where we can talk about it. So let's just do this poll. I've committed a microaggression frequently, occasionally, rarely, or never. So we'll take a minute with that poll. And Isha, are you able to put on your microphone and, and read if there are some comments people had in the chat? Because I apologize for some reason, I'm not able to access my chat. Sure, box. I can do that. Can Thank you. you. Can? I can. Thank you, Isha. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just scrolling up. Okay. Um, so there's a comment here working in sales, uh, in quotes, they think they will either think you're something to date or think of you as a daughter, both will mm. work, make the sale. Oh, wow. um, I never think of you as not white. I'm multiracial, it's another comment. Um, another comment, I'm Asian and often get told, wow, your English is really good, mm. or where are you from? Uh, they reply saying, here, America, and the person says, no, where are you really from? Right, yeah, that's very common. Mm -hmm. Um, if a younger person is behind me in line, I get ignored. Um, oh, interesting. So I live some in, ageism. Mm -hmm, I live and work in a very ethically diverse community and with, witness uh, microaggressions often. I was with a male friend in a store who uses a wheelchair and the clerk says to me, what is he looking for? Why don't, I said, why don't you ask him? Right. Um, families can be just as insensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the microaggressions can come from anywhere. Isha, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to keep uh, going? There's a couple more. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Um, people commenting to my toddler son that he can't like pink. That's for girls. Mm -hmm. These days, I witness microaggressions with my family members. Um, as a teacher, I've been ashamed that I can't pronounce a name and don't and I don't work to get it right. Complete strangers come up to my family and remark loudly as to how pretty my daughter is, all while my other daughters stand there and listen without anyone commenting about her. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, some of these really are borderline macroaggressions, as you can, mm -hmm. as you can tell, right? Yep. Um, but, but what we realize is it's, con it's constant. It happens all the time, and that's really important. Um, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and read. Thank you, Isha, so much. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have committed, um, not only 1% said frequently, but 47% um, uh, occasionally, 51% rarely, 1% never. So um, I, that feels very honest, you know, that, um, that some people are really maybe working hard not to do this, but, but occasionally people will do this. And the, the point is not to feel bad about it or you know, it's not some kind of contest, but rather just to say we're all, you know, this might happen. And we can either choose to work in a place where nobody says anything, you don't learn anything, or we can work in a place where people say, hey, you know, I just wanted to share with you, Anne, that, you know, when you did that in the meeting, 
I, it, it, it offended me and, and I want you to know this. And I get to decide as Anne, am I going to get defensive? Am I going to uh, feel shame? Am I going to disappear? Am I going to, uh, you know, never talk to that person again? Or am I going to see that actually the fact that they took the time to say something to me was a gift? It sounds hokey, but it's true. It's a gift when someone tells you that so that you are able to grow. I do have a five-year-old who is yelling upstairs, but she is with a trusted adult. So in case anybody hears any yelling, that's what that is. I'm going to go ahead and move forward into uh, what it, talking about what it means to be an ally. So I'm going to get my PowerPoint back up. Um, whoops, that's what I wanted. So some people call it champion, uh, co-conspirator, accomplice. There's always a new word. I like the word ally, that's what I use. It doesn't really matter what the word is. It's a, it's a concept, it's a placeholder that says whatever your lived experience, whatever your social identity, uh, whatever your role in an organization, you can be someone who cares about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so I say an ally is someone who's willing to pay attention to and take action around the social, economic, and political differences and equities that attend to people based on their social identities, um, age, race, class, et cetera. I have a couple slides I'm just going to kind of slip through for time, sorry, but I want to stop here for a minute before I show you a short video clip. Um, I do believe that most of us are not completely marginalized nor completely privileged. I'm an example of that. I'm white, I'm middle class, I'm also queer and female, so I have this mix of marginalized and privileged identities. And the whole point about being an ally is not to feel bad about your identities. Um, I can't change that I'm white. I can't uh, change that I was born in the United States, grew up speaking English, but what I can do is use my privilege to advance racial equity, to advance, uh, you know, uh, uh, social justice. So I believe allies move past shame, guilt, and blame, working to understand how privilege works in their life, as well as how marginalized others are perceived through stereotypes and cultural myths. And I'm going to go ahead and show this uh, short video clip. I love Dr. Joy DeGru. She's a social worker professor who does a lot of work around racial equity. In this video clip from Dr. Shakti Butler's Cracking the Codes, The System of Racial Inequality, she is just talking about go going to the grocery store and what it means to be an ally. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white, blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins and we, you know, it's the wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law is in front of me and she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me and I was directly behind her you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman, is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? This is a nice day today. They're just chatting up and she says, yes. Yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up, no conversation. She looks up at me absolutely no just little chatter and uh, I write my check my daughter however is 10 notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me so I write my check and she goes I'm gonna need two pieces of ID at which point my daughter looks at me and she gets very very embarrassed and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye like mommy you're not gonna you're not gonna let her do this why is she doing this to us right so I'm trying to figure out what I should do because behind me are two elderly white women, right? And I'm thinking, okay, so then I become the angry black woman, right? And they're gonna be, and I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I said, you know, some things you gotta choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check book, right? So the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating. Now my, my daughter is in full blown emotionally upset, who's 10. My sister-in-law walks back over and she steps in and she says, excuse me, 
why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you, you've been, she goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. It is totally unacceptable. At which point the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. Randall. Okay. Um, so during the video, I was able to, f to get my chat. So let's see if I can get it back. It just left again, but um, I want to go ahead and have us go through a couple of scenarios. So uh, I'll read this and then we'll um, see if we can't have a little bit of a conversation about it. Um, and I appreciate, I was able to see some of the comments. Um, so I appreciate everyone jumping in. So here's the first scenario. You're in a virtual meeting with a number of your colleagues. You're a group that has met for quite some time. So you know each other well. You have always noticed that there are some colleagues who tend to dominate the discussion. One of your female identified colleagues, Kate says, there are some guys who keep interrupting Maria, and since she's one of our newest members and female, can we just listen a little better, please? To this, one of your more dominating colleagues, Dan, apologies to Dan, Kate, and Maria's out there, um, says, let's not get all politically correct and make it about gender, okay? Sorry, Maria, I think it's just an extrovert, introvert thing, no big deal. Um, so what might you say or do, you are in that virtual meeting to act as an ally. If you identify as a man, how might you use your gender privilege to address the situation? So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the chat. Yay, it's working. So um, uh, anyone want to kind of jump in and share something you might say um, if, if you witness this? Because we've got Kate kind of coming out and noticing a dynamic. Um, and uh, if you don't know this, uh, there's all sorts of research that shows that women are much more likely to be interrupted by men. They are also more likely to have men in a meeting take an idea. So a woman might say an idea, uh, and then a man and doesn't get much feedback about it. A man takes the same idea, gets a lot of feedback. I hear this from women frequently when I'm training. And so Kate's trying to kind of call that out and, 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 and just saying, can we listen a little better? And then Dan kind of says, oh, let's not get politically correct. I think it's an extrovert introvert thing. So uh, if anybody willing to kind of jump in on the chat and um, since I self-identify as a woman, I would absolutely show support and solidarity, but feel it would be dismissed by Dan because I'm a woman, right? Um, and that's that's one of the things. I'll just share this quick quick uh, 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 bit of information. They did a study at the London School of Economics where they had um, a man, a white man, a white woman, a man of color, a woman of color, all talking about diversity. The only person who was rated positively was the white man, right? So all of the other people were seen as having an agenda. And so there, there's something about using one's privilege uh, to bring things up. It appears Maria is getting many interruptions when she is speaking. Let's all be, oh, so this is what Linda would say. Uh, let's all be more considerate and allow Maria to finish before we intervene. Great. Uh, I'm not sure if this would need to be addressed further in the group, but maybe explain later to Dan where your comments came from. Yep, that's a possibility. Um, you know, there's no one right way to do this. Uh, sometimes people think there is, there isn't. Uh, I think the one thing is you want to not let it go. And we do that far too often. We all do it. We're busy. We're stressed. You know, we don't know what to say in the moment. 
Um, so, so sometimes you could just circle back to Kate, to Maria, to Dan, um, or to the whole group and send an email um, or say, can we talk about this more? Um, I guess I would leave out the point that she was female and stress more on the fact that she was one of the newer members and we should show her our support by listening to what she has to say. Yeah, that's, step. that's, a, that's a great idea of just saying, hey, you know, uh, it's probably pretty hard to be new to a group. So uh, I hope we could all be a little more uh, understanding and encouraging to our newest colleague. Uh, I would support the comment by asking for common respect and honoring the contribution of all in this meeting. I would then follow up later with Dan and other male colleagues about making sure all opinions are honored when we work together. Right. Um, and and one thing to say too is, you know, Dan, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I will just put it out there that I personally uh, have never once, I've worked in diversity for over 25 years, never once passed a colleague in the hall in the Office for Equity and Diversity and said, hey, were you politically correct today? That's not our language, those of us who, who do this work. So I could just reframe that to Dan and say, hey, Dan, just to be clear, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm trying to be inclusive. Um, and um, I'm just kind of noticing a gender dynamic here. Um, and, and Dan, we can agree to disagree, but I do hope we can all agree that we want everyone to, uh, to talk, you know, to feel like we're getting everyone's input. Um, uh, if the group is, great point, established meeting or group norms, I would ask the group to consider whether interrupting others is in line with our meeting norms. And Sarah, that's a great point. That's something that you can do to be proactive to say, hey, you know, I know we all think we're gonna do great and get along, but things might get heated. Can we just talk a little bit about kind of some expectations for how we work together? So that when then this does happen, you can go back. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the second of our, um, okay, apologies. I got a, All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, well, I just lost my PowerPoint, I'm telling you. Um, here we go, resume share. I just love these buttons that tell you exactly what they mean. All right, here's our second scenario, and I'll read that one. You and a colleague, Jen, are on a virtual call. Jen is a white middle-class woman who has shared with you that she is sometimes tired of the constant talk about race. Jen asks if she can check in about something. You say, sure, and Jen says, I'm feeling so frustrated around one of my clients. He's a good guy and I know he's had a tough life. We talked about how important it is that he practice social distancing and we talked honestly and openly about how hard that is. He shared that he has family and friends who aren't taking it as seriously as he is. Continuing, Jen says, I just get so mad. I mean, he lives on the north side and get, I get all the racism and poverty that affects that community, but come on people, this is life and death. Why can't people just stay home? How hard can that be? What might you say or do to act as an ally in this situation? If you did not grow up in a situation similar to the clients, right? If you have some privilege around class and race, how might you use your privilege to address Jen's concerns? Because in Minnesota, I mean, I don't know how much you would think this is actually coded bias, but in Minnesota, we sometimes do a good job of coding our racism, of coding uh, other kinds of bias. Um, and so you've got Jen saying, you know, I get all the racism and poverty, but how hard can it be? Um, question, I know each situation is unique, but is it important to directly confront the likely racist behavior or should we catch more flies with honey and use a less confrontational approach that may avoid calling out the racism? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, important to directly confront the likely racist behavior. Well, um, I mean, here's the thing. I, I'm, I, I think the whole notion of con confrontational is very loaded. Um, I have, I've done lots and lots of training and I've had people uh, tell me that they're from the South. I've had people tell me they're from the East Coast uh, and tell me sometimes I've had people of color all say that they are much more direct than a lot of kind of white Minnesotans and that when they're direct, they're perceived as being confrontational. So I think what even counts as confrontational is, is is probably somewhat cultural and regional. Um, and so part of it is what you're comfortable with. I mean, um, I'm generally going to attempt to try to reframe something with someone while maintaining the relationship. 
So in general, I want to avoid being shaming or blaming or making someone feel like they're getting a lecture. I don't think people learn in that. You know, if somebody sat down and said, said, Anne, fit, sit down, I'm going to tell you how you're wrong about race. I might be wrong about race, but the, that setup isn't probably going to work for me. I like people, I sometimes like um, using my own privilege to model. So what I might say to Jen, as a because I identify as white and also grew up middle class, is say, Jen, you know what? I don't have some of the same experiences as your client. And I can understand how it's tempting sometimes to see these things as a simple case of just needing to stay at home. But one thing I've learned is that there's a lot I don't know about what it's like to live every day with racism, to live, uh, uh, you know, with sometimes um, class distinctions that impact what jobs people do and how easy it is to social distance, um, things about, you know, and, and kind of share some of that and share some of my own learning to kind of invite Jen into that learning. I want to read some of the other comments uh, and pay attention to time. Let's um, say, let's get curious about what you're feeling and what messages you received about race. I like that. Let's get curious. That's great. Um, bring up the same thing as happening in your own neighborhood. So I think it's a human nature issue versus a race and poverty issue. I love that. That's a great reframe. Because, of course, the implication is all white middle class people are, 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 are social distancing. Hello, you know, just look at what's going on across our country. That is not true at all. Um, I might say something like, I can imagine a number of reasons it might be hard for someone to stay home. What do you think it's about from his perspective? That's a great, I love that. And and um, you've got some reframing and then a, an open-ended question. Thanks, Anne. I agree and do a lot of diversity, equity training and teach reframing a lot, but worry I might be taking the easy way out. Well, you know, what you want is to keep people, you, you want to, you're, it's a balancing act. You want to stay true to what you need to say and not water it down and say things like, well, you know, uh, you, you never want to say anything that, that continues the bias. And you want to bring people along if you can. And recognizing that you actually have no control over whether they bring, a, you know, all you can do is kind of give them the reframe and, and hope for the best. That came off wrong. Not hope for the best. You can, you can maintain the relationship um, and be vulnerable and honest yourself. But um, I want to share this one thing. My wife is a therapist and uh, she did a training on compassion fatigue. And she said, you know, the guy said, uh, it was very interesting. And the guy said, the outcome of your work is none of your business. And I said to my wife, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. What do you mean? The outcome of my, that's why I do the work for the outcome. And she said, yeah, but you can't control it. That's the point I was trying to make that if we, if we think I did try to reframe something, I really did try to, to, to push on Jen or Dan a little bit in, in some way, and they don't change. Sometimes we say we failed, but we didn't. We, we, we never fail when we stay true to our values, when we, when we, in ways that work for us and that keep us safe, but also keep us being vulnerable and, 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 and challenging us, when we speak our truth and attempt to, to act as, a, as an advocate, as an ally, as a champion, we're not failing because we can't ever control whether someone can take that learning. And it might take seven times for Jen to finally get that point. I'm, I'm a white person who will spend the rest of my life struggling with my own white privilege and, um, and my own re unlearning, relearning uh, the, the white supremacy that I've been taught. Um, you have to acknowledge uh, her frustration and ask her where it's coming from. That's a great idea. Is it truly race-based or the fact that she feels frustrated over the fact that she can't do anything to help and it came out, uh, came out as racial right? So that, that doing some open-ended questions, some staying in relationship with her and asking, uh, planting a seed of thought, and we plant a seed. Yeah, my point, exactly. You're planting seeds all the time. We, thank you so much. Um, isn't it nice that I actually managed to find the chat? Okay, um, this is our next steps. And the last, um, well, with the Q&A is the last. So I just want to share this and then we'll uh, have a chance for a little Q&A. But I just want you to consider what your next steps can be as you develop your understanding of and commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. For those of you who are kind of already allies, I can tell a lot of you already are. Um, I always push people to go from being an ally to being a leader. And I know leader is a very loaded word. A lot of people don't like it. Just, you know, it's leader with a small L. But in whatever way you can, how can you be a role model and a leader on these issues? Because here's the thing, we need leaders. We need people to take it up a notch and say, I don't just want to be the person who responds to a comment. I want to be the person who goes into a committee meeting 
notices the agenda, notices who's talking, and brings that diversity, equity, and inclusion or social justice lens to everything we're doing. That's a leader. So what can I commit to do in one week? What can I commit to do in the coming year? And perhaps the most important question I can ask you, how can you hold yourself accountable? Because when this work gets complex and messy and difficult, and it's not if, it's when, because it will, when you walk away from it, when you say, oh, I can't talk about this race stuff anymore, it's just too messy, that's usually when you know you're white, right? Because folks of color and native folks don't walk away from it. I don't walk away from being queer. It kind of follows me into every space. Um, and so when things get challenging, how do you stay in it, especially when you have privilege? And so I just want to, with the three minutes I have left, um, just open it up and say, I, you know, do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? And also, if anybody wants to share a next step, I would love that. So curious if there's any kind of anything you want to raise as you're out there. Um, Oh, I think someone's saying I don't have to be P, and I would bet that Anna's saying I don't have to be perfect. Is that right? Um, uh, because I hope that's what you're saying, because that's a great comment, because um, I, it reminds me of something I often say. The goal is not perfection in this work, um, because we'll never be perfect. The goal is to be intentional and deliberate. Why did you do this? Why, did you, why do you do your work this way? Why do you, you know, work with clients this way? Why do you work with colleagues? I don't know. We've always done it that way. That isn't going to cut it anymore. Um, uh, yes, perfect, but I do have to intervene, right? So I have to try, I have to step up, and then I have to learn from when I make mistakes, and I have to be open to kind of constructive criticism and uh, be willing to be vulnerable and held accountable. Notice more, absolutely, it's a really big piece of this work is to notice, um, address more, and continue to self examine and change. Well said. Um, start standing up for myself in times I experience microaggressions and notice when people in my community commit them. I love that. Yeah, standing up for ourselves. If, you know, um, if, if every time these things happen, people can find a way, uh, not every time, but whenever they can, uh, can find a way to stand up for themselves. And then, and then, you know, if it happens to you, stand up for yourself. If it happens to someone else, be that person who has their back and encourage, uh, be encouraging as much as possible. Um, I think we got one more minute. Any other kind of comments or questions or again, a next step, not to assume we all follow a way of believing or living, absolutely. Not everyone believes in the same thing, it's absolutely true. Instead of saying what's wrong with you, say what happened to you that you feel or act this way, I love that. What is your experience, what in your experience makes you feel this way, right? These are the kind of questions that create uh, kind of some trust. Something I learned on a leadership webinar yesterday, I will commit to turning instances when I feel defensive into opportunities for self-examination. Absolutely. I think this applies to being an ally. Absolutely. Any recommended reading as we start on this journey? Well, I will tell you, I, I really like Brene Brown's uh, work. Um, I think uh, there's also, of course, White Fragility with Robin DiAngelo, My Grandmother's Hand from Resma and Akim, some, some books. Um, when I try to speak up, my voice gets shaky and what I say is not taken seriously. How do you overcome this fear and learn to be more assertive and heard? Keep practicing, keep practicing. You will get more confident. And um, here's the other thing. I, I'm sitting in front of a big picture of Audre Lorde. I love Audre Lorde's work. Um, she's a black lesbian poet, warrior. This is how she described herself. And it's this big quote that kind of guides everything I do. She says, when I dare to be powerful, to, and I'm literally reading this from a wall in my basement, when I dare to be powerful to use my strength in the service of my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. We will be, our voice will tremble. For me, my face gets red. It's just never going to change. That's who I am, the Irish heritage in me. Uh, and English heritage, right? So we're going to get flushed, uh, some of us. We're going to, you know, shake. We're, our voice is going to shake. That doesn't have to mean anything other than you're speaking your truth. Um, and, and I love that because we are going to be afraid. And courage comes when we are afraid and we still do it. Um, and so I think that's really important. When I try to speak up, my, uh, we, uh, thank you. I love Brene Brown. Yeah, I love her because th we have to be vulnerable in this work. I would love to hear what an appropriate response is when someone tells me to smile more. Well, um, uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a great comment. Um, I, I wanna um, I'm gonna I wanna be respectful of time. I'm gonna end with this one little story. 
I, I, did I share this? I shared the story about the woman who had faced the sexual harassment. Well, she told me another story. She said that she was running the Twin Cities Marathon and halfway through the marathon, a uh, man she's never met yelled at her, you'll do better if you smile. Well, what she did was flip him off. Okay, now that's, I'm not necessarily recommending that, but uh, she found her power in that moment. Um, but, you know, something like, you know, uh, that's not helpful, uh, you know, please don't say that to me. If you feel like you're compelled, I mean, I think that would be, just be a great thing to, to bring up sometime. And a lot of this that I've shared with you, these are all conversations you can have in your workplace, right? So I love the idea of like, hey, you know what? I have a question. Before we start the staff meeting, could we spend five minutes talking about uh, brainstorming what we can say as women when a man tells us to smile more, right? Why couldn't you do that in a staff meeting? Because that affects you, right? That's just an idea. Thank you. So sick of hearing that as a woman, uh, you look better when you smile, right? And so I hope for those folks who are on this uh, webinar, and then I, I'll wrap up, um, to just um, pay attention to how you can how you can show up for your colleagues in ways that maybe you haven't haven't quite shown up yet, or how you can continue to show up and act as a role model for other people. Anyway, I know I'm fitting a lot into a small amount of time, but thank you very much. I want to really thank Isha for helping me out navigating all of this. Um, you will get the PowerPoint, which has my contact information. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to email me, and I really appreciate you being on this webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Yep.